All right, so uh, thanks very much to Ian and to Larry for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to take part in, in this seminar and I'm sorry I haven't been able to attend in person all the time, I usually teach at this time, um, but it's nice to have them up on YouTube for sure. All right, um, so this talk is based on uh, these two papers up on the archive. And um, the, uh, the goals of the, so the first paper here, this is a, a partition asymptotic um, proofs with probabilistic methods. So the first goal will be to uh, discuss those probabilistic methods for proving asymptotics. And then I wanna contrast that with, um, uh, with uh, these proofs of limit shapes for unimodal sequences where the probabilistic methods aren't um, as useful. So if we have time, I'll describe some direct generating functions approaches to limit shapes for unimodal sequences. All right. Let me uh, actually set my timer here. All right, good to go. So uh, first, let's make sure we're all on the same page with partitions. So uh, a partition of an integer n is a multiset of positive integers, lambda k, um, that are uh, written in weakly decreasing order, and they sum to n. So some notation, we'll write uh, lambda as a par partition of n like that. We'll denote the size with this sort of absolute value. And then P of N is the total number of partitions of N. So as is customary in partitions talk, here are all the partitions of four. There are five of them, so P of four equals five. And visually, uh, partitions can be represented by their Young or Ferris diagrams. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna make them columns of squares. So here's a partition of 41 and uh, each part corresponds to a column of that many squares. And represented in this way, there's a natural involution on partitions called conjugation, where you just, uh, flip a partition diagram about this um, 45 degree diagonal and you get another partition. Okay, so sort of the most basic question we can ask about partitions, how many partitions event are there? So one answer is that P of N is the coefficient of Q to the N in this infinite product here. Um, that's easily seen by expanding each of these factors as a geometric series. If you collect coefficients of Q to the N, that generates P of N. And uh, this infinite product is basically a modular form, basically one over the Dedekind eta function. And in a very important paper from 101 years ago, Hardy and Ramanujan um, used that modularity to prove uh, an asymptotic series for, for P of N. And then Rademacher later came and proved a convergent series. So in particular, um, this is the main term, the well-known main term for the partition function. And um, if you've never seen, seen that before, um, I just want to point out that we have an exponential of a constant times root N, and then we're dividing by some power of N. And this is a very common shape for um, partition asymptotics to take. Here's another uh, asymptotic formula for the number of distinct parts partitions of N. Um, that's the coefficient of Q to the N in this product where uh, we only have Q to the K once there because parts are distinct. That's also a modular form. So um, Hardy and Ramanujan also gave an asymptotic series for D of N, 
and that was later uh, improved by Haggis to a convergent series. So this is what the main term looks like. Again, we have an exponential of constant times root n, and we're dividing by some power of n. All right, one other asymptotic formula that I want to mention. Uh, so this time we'll restrict partitions. We'll put a restriction on the largest part. So P sub T of N will be partitions of N with the largest part bounded by T root N. That's the coefficient in this partial product, uh, which is not a modular form, but classical techniques like the saddle point method um, allow you to get the main asymptotic term. Uh, so here is an asymptotic proof in three different ways by these individuals, uh, Zekeresh, Canfield, and Ramek. Uh, so I'm not going to write this down precisely, but this, this is the form. We have an exponential of constant times root n. We're dividing by a power of n. And we also have this other parameter, alpha, that satisfies some integral equation. Okay, so the, the proofs given by these three individuals, uh, Zekeresh gave like a uh, classical saddle point method proof. So that means Cauchy's integral theorem and some complex analysis. Canfield's proof was based on recurrences for, the, for, for P sub T of N and just uh, real analysis, no complex analysis. And then Ramek uh, gave a probabilistic proof. And this is really the same thing as a saddle point method proof, but it's just a more intuitive reformulation of this proof. OK, so here is uh, the first result that I want to talk about. Um, it's basically the same generating function, except we have distinct parts. So dt of n is distinct parts partitions, largest part bounded by t root n. And uh, this is the shape of the asymptotic formula. So just for completeness, I've the whole thing down, but uh, I just want to highlight, I guess, a couple of things here. So we have an exponential of constant times root n dividing by a power of n. And things are going to depend on this beta, which satisfies an integral equation. Uh, and the other thing I want to draw your attention to is this oscillation. So in this a sub n uh, constant, well, it's not constant. This term here, uh, we have an oscillation. This, these curly brackets are uh, fractional parts. So this is an oscillatory, bounded oscillatory term. And uh, it's based on a probabilistic model. All right, so uh, I'll, I'll get to talking about um, the, the ideas behind the proof um, a little bit later, but let me first talk about um, some more statistics for partitions. Um, so these results are going to be easier to state if we introduce uh, this uniform probability measure on partitions of n. So we'll say capital P sub n of lambda is 1 over the total number of, oops, of partitions. Okay. So a uh, question we might want to ask is what is the size of the largest part of a typical partition of n? So this was sort of one of the first uh, distributional results for, um, for statistics for partitions. Um, so from 1941, Erdős and Lehner proved that um, we have this distribution here. So uh, the way you can sort of interpret that, if you flip this inequality, inequality around, that says that typically the largest part is this right here, c root n log c root n. And the error is where we see this extreme value distribution. So this 
e to the minus e to the minus x. That's the uh, cumulative distribution for an extreme value distribution. Okay, now the proof, their proof is uh, pretty straightforward. You just uh, write the number of partitions of n where the largest part is bounded by k. You just represent that uh, as follows by inclusion exclusion. So you start with all the partitions of n, subtract off those whose largest part is bigger than k, then you subtract it off too many, so you have to add back in this. It's just inclusion exclusion. And then if you plug in this value of k and the hardy ramanujan asymptotic formula, then that leads to their result. All right, how about the distribution of the teeth largest? We have the same basic same expression on the left for, for the teeth largest part lambda t. Um, then that was proved to have this distribution um, by Fristet. And uh, he also found the joint distribution for um, the t the first tn largest parts where tn is little o of n to the fourth and distributions for many other statistics. So first that went uh, a lot further with the distributional results for partitions than, than anyone had before. And the main reason for that was his new probabilistic framework to study partition statistics. Uh, so this is the uh, bare bones of, of the idea that I'll flesh out a little bit more later. So first that's conditioning device, sort of the, the key ideas are, are the following. So if capital N represents the size of a partition and you allow that to be a random variable. So the size of a partition is a random variable. Then the uniform probability measure, P sub N, equals this other probability measure, Q. It, that's a probability measure on all partitions, not just partitions of N, all partitions, conditioned on capital N equals N. And, and this is really a family of probability measures depending on this parameter, little Q, but it's better in the sense that the distributions are easier to work out under capital Q sub Q. And then Fristet showed how to transfer those back to the uniform probability measure. Okay, yeah, uh, maybe I'll pause there. If there are any questions about anything I've mentioned so far. Okay. So another um, question about statistics for partitions. What are the likely shapes of diagrams among partitions of N? So if you look at all the Ferris diagrams of size N, which, you know, what are the likely shapes that you see as N tends to infinity? So the, the striking thing is, uh, is the following. So here's a density plot of all partitions of 300. And I've, uh, a box is um, shaded according to how often that occurs in partitions of 300. So you can clearly see that um, it, it appears that there's a single limit shape for partitions of 300, or partitions of n. And, and that is a uh, fact. Um, perhaps not as surprising if you're a probabilist, but to me, it's still quite striking that there's a single limit shape for partitions. So to state a little bit more precisely, we'll let uh, phi tilde of lambda be the renormalized shape. This means we rescale everything by one over root n. 
So here's an example of a, a rescaled diagram of size 19. The reason we do that is so that the total area is one and we can now talk about things. We can talk about what's happening in tends to infinity. Okay. Uh, so here is the, the limit shape. Let epsilon be greater than zero and take an epsilon neighborhood of this curve. So this is the blue curve you saw on the previous slide. Uh, then it was conjectured by, by many people in various ways and at various strengths um, that, that uh, this curve was a limit shape for um, partitions. So roughly what that means is that the limit as n tends to infinity of the probability renormalized shape is within epsilon of that curve, that limiting probability is one. So this was uh, first guessed by Temperley actually for statistical physics reasons. Um, and this also comes up in work of Shelley and Turan. And then Vershik conjectured many limit shapes, not just for unrestricted partitions, but for different types of partitions and under different probability measures, like the Plancherel uh, measure. And, and he was using uh, Fristet's conditioning device when he did that. So this was proved, uh, a very strong version of this was proved by Dembo, Vershik, and Zaituni in 98. Um, they proved large deviation principle using uh, Fristet's conditioning device. Is that my email ringing or? Yeah, let me get rid of that. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Dimbo Vershik Zaituni proved this. And then uh, Vershik gave a more elementary proof by just directly estimating generating functions. And I'll just call your attention to this. There's also a limit shape for distinct parts partitions. All right, so the question I wanted to ask was, uh, are there limit shapes for unimodal sequences? So let's define uh, unimodal sequences and then talk about the limit shapes. So a unimodal sequence lambda of size n is a sequence of positive integers satisfying these inequalities and summing to n. So uh, basically a unimodal sequence were allowed to increase and then decrease. So it's kind of double-sided partitions, although that's not exactly what they are. Uh, and some, some terminology, this lambda p I'll call a peak, and also any other parts that are the same size, those are going to be called peaks. So for example, here are all the unimodal sequences of size 4, all the ways you can write 4 uh, where the parts satisfy these inequalities. So uh, u of 4, the number of unimodal sequences of size 4, is 8. Just to uh, read this, um, so because of peaks, so if you have a unimodal sequence, um, there's going to be more than one way to break that up into two partitions because you can divide it at multiple places um, at the peak. So the generating function for these things is not this, this product squared, um, which would be the generating function for double partitions. You have to multiply by this sparse series um, that sort of um, accounts for these issues with the peaks. 
So this is a, a module infinite products is a modular object, and then this is a false theta function. And I just want to point out that um, an asymptotic for you uh, was proved back in 51 by Olick. Um, again, we see an exponential of root n divided by a power of n. And for a long time, there was no uh, nothing anywhere close to a convergent series for U of n um, until last year, Bringman and uh, Nazaroglu uh, uh, proved a convergent series for U of n by better understanding the, um, the modularity of uh, this false theta function. Okay, so I want to talk about three types of unimodal sequence. And I'll just define these with these pictures over here. Unrestricted, which are just regular unimodal sequences. Strongly unimodal sequences, where we have strict inequalities on the left and the right. Semi-strict, where we have strict inequalities like only on one side. So we'll say to the left side. And there are the uh, the phi tilde of lambda, the renormalized shapes for these sequences. So again, we'll rescale in the same way. We'll rescale by one over root n. So the question we want to answer: uh, What is the typical shape of unimodal sequences of size n? So once again, there's the limit shape for partitions. Now, unimodal sequences are not double partitions, but kind of heuristically we would expect and the limit shape them to behave like that. So we can expect these limit shapes here. Uh, so we can expect, for example, unrestricted unimodal sequences to have both sides being like half the limit shape for partitions. Strongly unimodal sequences would have each half being the limit shape for distinct parts partitions. And okay, semi-strict, you'd expect the left to be this distinct part shape and the right to be this unrestricted shape, but it's unclear at the outset what the scaling would be on both sides, right? So it's, it's unclear I'm going to put half the area on the left, half the area on the right, one third, two thirds, one fourth, three fourths. How, how is that going to work? So here are the results. Uh, indeed, we do get the expected limit shape for unrestricted unimodal sequences. So uh, there it is. And um, if you uh, look at a particular side, uh, e each side is the limit partition scaled down to have area one half. There's the limit shape for strongly unimodal sequences. Um, each side is the limit shape for distinct parts partitions scaled down so that the area beneath is a half. And then that's what semi-strict looks like. Uh, and the uh, area breakdown is one third, two thirds. So a third of the area is over here and two thirds of the area is over here. Um, maybe I'll stop for a quick second there. Are there any questions about anything? Okay, so how do we interpret shapes? Well, uh, limit shapes, they're basically zero one laws for medium sized parts, parts that are around square root n. 
So for example, you could say something like this. Uh, if you fix an epsilon greater than zero, then 100% of strongly unimodal sequences, as n tends to infinity, uh, the number of parts lies in this very tight interval around uh, this number times square root n. And it's worth pointing out that limit shapes say very little about the very small and very large parts in partitions. So they, they don't tell us really anything about the distribution of parts that are smaller than, of a smaller order than root n and of a larger order than root n. Okay, um, I think I'm going to that. So perhaps a uh, somewhat unexpected consequence of these limit shapes is that you can get a limit shape for over partitions using the, uh, the limit shape for semi-strict unimodal sequences. All right, so question, um, are there limit shapes for over partitions? So these, so over partitions, these were introduced by Quartil and Lovejoy in 2004. And an over partition of N is a partition in which the last occurrence of a part may or may not be marked. So it's easy to see with an example. Um, here are all the over partitions of four. And for example, um, with this two plus one plus one, I'm allowed to overmark this two, and I'm over and I'm allowed to overmark this one if I want to. So th so this occurs like three times here. So over p of four equals twelve, and and these were introduced to by Quartil and Lovejoy to um, uh, give com combinatorial explanations of some Q series identities. All right, so uh, recently uh, in a paper by DeSalvo and Pack, they showed basically that if you have a partition bijection that is geometrically nice in some sense, that allows you to transfer the limit shapes, right? So basically if you think about the geometric operation you perform on partition diagrams to get uh, that, that, that geometric bijection, you can basically do the same geometry on the limit shapes and transfer limit shapes. So sort of inspired by this, um, I was able to drive a limit shape for over partitions. So over partitions are connected to semi-strict unimodal sequences, and this is um, immediate from the generating functions and there's a very simple bijective proof of this, uh, that, that over P of N equals semi-strict of N plus semi-strict of N plus one. So uh, here's the proof. Um, so suppose you start with an over partition, which has a single marked largest part, right here, then in that case, you just shift all the marked parts over to the left. And because marked parts are distinct, like parts can only be marked at most once, so, so the marked parts are gonna be distinct. This right here, we have, we have strict inequalities on the left, so that's a uh, semi-strict unimodal sequence. And the other case, if we have at least one unmarked largest part, then uh, add a box over, over that, shift the marked parts over to the left, and you get a uh, semi-strict unimodal sequence of size n plus one. So the geometry bijection is essentially just things uh, over to the left. Or if you're going to go in the opposite direction, semi-strict unimodal sequences, to, just since you just shift 
to the right. So that allows you to transfer limit shapes. You get a limit shape for over partitions by basically just adding um, the horizontal components of, uh, of the limit shape for semi-strict unimodal sequences. So there it is. And um, so over partitions, just like partitions, they have this conjugation symmetry. So if that really is the limit shape, we should expect to see conjugation symmetry. Uh, so we should expect that to be symmetric in X and Y, and it is. Here's a comparison of the limit shapes for partitions and over partitions. They're very similar. Um, but the over partitions limit shape sort of bulges out near the middle a little bit more. And I think it would be very interesting to try and come up with a more direct combinatorial explanation for this difference we see in, in, in these limit shapes. So is there an explanation for that that doesn't go through this limit shapes of semi-strict unimodal sequences. Is there a more direct explanation for this? And a very general type of question uh, that would be interesting to explore would be uh, the following. Uh, how should we alter the definition of partitions to achieve certain effects in the limit shape? Right, so if we allow uh, the occurrence of the last part to be marked, that creates this sort of bulge out in the diagram. So, you know, what else can you do to the definition of partitions to affect uh, the way the limit shape looks? All right. Um, so now I'm going to get into the, uh, the proof of the asymptotic formula for this function dt of n. And I'm going to discuss some of the uh, probabilistic ideas to go into this a little bit. Um, but I'll stop here again for questions. Are there any questions, comments, concerns at this point? Yes, I, I have a quick question. So yeah. You mentioned that like the, these probabilistic things and the shapes originally for partitions had like a motivation for coming from statistical physics or something like that. Is there like an analogous motivation for all the for the other types of partitions you've been studying and like unimodal sequences and things like that? Is there a motivation coming from statistical physics for these other or, things too? I guess, or is there just like a, a specific reason? I mean, unimodal sequences, I think, is um, natural, but is there a reason, for example, to study like these partitions with distinct parts with largest part up to something. Um, yeah, okay, so my motivation was that I needed this asymptotic formula to prove limit shapes for unimodal sequences. So it. that, yeah, that, that was my motivation. I should have mentioned that, I guess. Um, but I think that uh, it's nice to have an exposition of some of these probabilistic ideas um, instead of classical saddle point method proofs. So, okay. right. thanks. Yeah. Well, on that note, I'll, I'll just add, like, well, I was wondering about if anyone studied, for example, ranks, like approximately how many partitions have rank less than t times square root of n or something you mentioned partitions by number of parts, and Sekiris also looked at um, partitions into exactly k parts, and it's some combination of those two things. So the same kind of heuristics or methods work for that kind of thing? Um, yeah, so the rank, I don't know if anyone studied the rank using Fristet's um, probabilistic machinery. We do have like um, distributional results for the rank, you know, so people have studied the yeah. moments of the rank and proved asymptotics for those and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm not sure anyone studied it yet with the probabilistic machinery. Well, um, I'm trying to think. There was a, 
Well, Rob Rhodes looked at the Dan Peary and Rob Rhodes looked at a probabilistic machinery for studying distributions of cranks because Dyson had had a kind of statistical mechanics conjecture about what those should be. So I don't, you know, that one. I'm wondering if that's related to the type of probabilistic machinery you're mentioning. Um, yeah, I'm not uh, familiar with that paper, so I'll have to. Okay. Have to look that up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, good. So, yeah, let's get into uh, this proof and and some of the probabilistic ideas. So remember the goal is to find an asymptotic formula for dt of n. Um, this is the coefficients of q to the n and this generating function, which I'm gonna call d, capital dt of q. All right, so here are the probability measures, q, capital Q sub q. So for a parameter little q in zero one, you define a probability measure on all partitions as Q to the size of the partition divided by the generating function. So clearly that's a probability measure. If you add that up over all partitions, right, you get generating function over generating function, so that's equal to one. So this is a probability measure. And we'll inter introduce some random variables x k's, which tell us the number of k's in the partition lambda. So we're dealing with distinct parts of partitions, so that makes them Bernoulli random variables. Take values either zero or one, either k occurs or it doesn't. So uh, for example, x3, uh, th this partition here would be one, because there's one three in that partition. Okay, fine. introduce the random variable capital N to be the sum of K, X, K, and that tells you the size, right? If you add up K times the multiplicity of K in a partition, that gives you the size of the partition. So for example, N of that same partition is 10. So here are some facts about this, uh, this setup. The X, Ks, these random variables are independent under, under Q sub Q. And uh, that models heuristically what we would expect to happen at least for small parts. Like if you think about it, the number of twos and the number of fives in partitions of N, those aren't independent events, but as N gets larger and larger, that, uh, you'd expect uh, those to be uh, more and more closer to independent. So at least for bounded parts, uh, these, these X case basically what we expect to have. And anyway, the, the probability that capital N equal little N, where you just add up QN, which is the reciprocal of the gener generating function, you add that up DTN times. So that's where that comes from. And now we have an equation for this thing we're trying to find the asymptotic of, uh, an asymptotic for, right? So uh, with, there's gonna be a particular choice of the parameter Q that's useful. So if you choose Q to be e to the minus beta over root n, beta defined in the, in the asymptotic, uh, theorem. That choice of Q minimizes this trivial inequality here. Um, so, uh, you know, clearly the, the nth coefficient here is less than or equal to this. That's, uh, that's obvious. This, the choice of Q that minimizes this by this equation maximizes this probability, which intuitively is what you want to do. You want to maximize uh, the probability that capital N equals N. Um, and uh, this inequality here, minimizing this inequality is uh, 
known as finding the saddle point here. So what this says is that the saddle point equation is the same thing as saying that the expected value of capital N is little n, right? That's gonna maximize this Q, Q sub Q, Q of capital N equals N. So the saddle point equation is equivalent to expectation of capital N equals N. All right, now capital N, that's a sum of independent random variables. So you would expect that that satisfies some sort of central limit theorem. And indeed it does. Uh, so if you let sigma n be the standard deviation, um, then for this q, uh, capital N minus n over sigma n is asymptotically normal, zero, one. So that thing we want to find in, in, in the expression for dt of n, this probability, uh, so we can heuristically write down a, a guess for what this should be using the fact that using this normality. So uh, in capital N takes only integer values. So uh, this here is equal to this right here. And now uh, we have a central limit theorem that does not at all imply this local limit theorem I have here, but uh, this does yield the correct uh, result for the asymptotic in the end. So uh, if you pretend you can pass to this local limit here, um, then you do get the correct uh, asymptotic for this thing here. So putting that all together, um, I'm lying a lot on this slide, but this is basically how you can think about this. So you choose Q so that the expectation of capital N is N. And because DT of N equals this probability times um, Q to the minus N D to the N, here's what you can do. So the thing in red, you just um, do classical saddle point balance with euler maclaurin summation for that. And then uh, you prove the heuristic on the previous page by Fourier inversion of the characteristic function for uh, capital N. And, and these things basically lead to um, the, the portions of the asymptotic I have here. Okay, now, as I said before, this is really just a restatement of the, of the way a circle method, saddle point method proof works. Um, and this step I have here, that is really equivalent to the types of integral calculations you're going to do um, for, for the saddle point method. Um, but the nice thing about this is that we have a heuristic way to predict the way the asymptotic should look. Okay, and uh, let me say a word about Boltzmann models. So this, so Frischet's idea of um, uh, of these probability measures has been extended um, by by these authors to general combinatorial structures. So uh, Duchamp, Flagellet, Louchard, Schaefer in two thousand three um, gave a paper on Boltzmann models for general combinatorial structures, and this works in basically the same way. So if you have a class of objects of size n, and then c is all the objects together, then you can study the uniform probability measure on, on objects from cn using this Boltzmann uh, model. And it, it works the same way that our uh, that Fristet's probability measure for partitions works. So namely the probability of gamma is Q to the size of gamma divided by um, the generating function. And um, in, in this paper, they showed that uh, basically allowing the size to be a random variable 
leads you to faster sampling algorithms for these general combinatorial structures. All right. Now, unfortunately, uh, Boltzmann models don't seem to work as well for unimodal sequences. Um, and that's basically because the generating function for unimodal sequences is not an infinite product. Now, this is maybe a strong statement here, uh, so maybe I'm, I'm wrong about that, but at least in my experience, I haven't found the Boltzmann model to be uh, anything other than messy. So that means to study uh, statistics for unimodal sequences, we need a more direct generating functions based approach. All right, so I have a, a couple of slides to talk about the proof of limit shapes for semi strict unimodal sequences. So, uh, to prove these limit shapes, uh, we basically take two steps. Uh, so, for the first step, we'll prove limit shapes for the left and right halves of diagrams in isolation. So this will, and the result will say that a proportion of 0% are not in these epsilon neighborhoods of the left and right halves. Now that doesn't give you um, a limit shape. You can have some degenerate uh, limit shapes if you just prove this 0% law. So to avoid that, to avoid degenerate limit shapes, we need to show that peaks are typically larger than root n on average. So here is uh, step one. So to uh, um, basically what you want to do to, uh, to prove limit shapes is look at the proportion of sequences uh, with some condition like this, with exactly a left parts less than or equal to b. Now, if you set up the generating functions in um, a nice way, you'll get that uh, that's less than or equal to um, this right here. Um, so I have uh, a fraction that involves um, well, let's say what can I say about this? Okay, anyway, th this is what you get when you do that. And, uh, and uh, okay, let's see. <clears throat> so uh, basically, uh, there's a unique kappa, there's a unique kappa that makes this quotient here small that makes it um, exponential of little o of root n. And with that q in hand, you then go and find a z that makes uh, this product small. And you can do that uniformly for all pairs a, b, such that that vertex in the diagram lambda is not in, is not in the epsilon neighborhood of the limit shape. So basically, you can get a uniform bound uh, tending to zero for all pairs A, B that are uh, where the vertex is not close to the limit shape and where A, B um, are on the, on the order of root n. And that, uh, so the, the total number of vertices is at most n squared, and that goes to zero so that proves um, the uh, left half of the limit shape. And finally, to uh, complete the proof, what we want to do is show that peaks are, peaks are larger than on average. So we want to show that this quotient tends to zero. And we do that by, we can, we can do that by just injecting into pairs of partitions. So there, there's strictly more of these pairs of partitions, but that's gonna be enough. 
And here's where I had to know the asymptotic for this d t of n. So uh, I just proved the asymptotic for these p t of n, and then uh, with my asymptotic for the d t of n, um, that gives you that the, the quotient here tends to zero. All right, so that's basically it. Uh, let me also show you this last slide. Uh, these are the the apparent limit shapes for uh, for uh, these distinct parts partitions with largest part at most t root n. Um, so here's what they look like for a variety of, uh, of values of t. And uh, I find it interesting that the concavity of these curves actually changes at t equals 2. So these, these last two, the blue and the violets are convex and uh, the other ones, the orange and the red are concave. So is there an explanation for that? That would be interesting to see. So yeah, stop there. Thanks very much for listening. Great, let's, uh, let's thank Walter for his talk. I guess either um, and then, yeah, I guess, uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Um, so uh, it's my first time seeing these unimodal sequences like this. So I know um, Pack and DeSalvo have a result about the log concavity of P of N. Do you know if there's anything been done on log concavity for like the number of uh, these unimodal sequences? So yes, there have been done, uh, but I, off the top of my head, I'm not sure exactly what um, but people have looked at the concavity of uh, modal sequences and various restrictions and stuff. So, so there probably is some stuff out there. I'm not sure how strong, but yeah, people have looked at it. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. About the... Uh concavity changing at t equals two. Um, did you check some like more, yeah, you have half integer values. Did you check at values like in between 1.5 1, 1. and 2 or 2 and 2.5 to zoom in to see if it's like a really significant number? So I, I, I mean, I know what the formula for these limit shapes should be. I just didn't write it down here. So yeah. um, I mean, I know the fact that that's it is precisely two. Yeah. Okay. I was just wondering if, like, yeah, I know. A partition, right? And there's something with, like, a uh, maybe a square root of six in it or something. You know, so you, you cut out for a little bit um, in the oh. first part. Sorry. Yeah. I was just saying, I was wondering, like, I know that Erdős and Lehner, for example, I think they were the first to give some kind of um, result about average sizes of partitions and they involve numbers like pi or square root of six. And I just wondered if there was like some other number behind it. But since you say it, you can prove that it's precisely t equals two. Um, yeah, that's very curious. Interesting. We have uh, any other questions or comments? Um, well, if not, then uh, let's thank Walter again for his talk. And let's see.